battle You see my victory When all I see is a mountain You see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. All right, let's shout this out. Come on. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through. Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Sing it out now. week we introduced a brand new song and we're going to worship with that again this morning. I'm asking in the Father's name Feel your heart to me I want to bear the fruit that Come abide in me, show me your ways, show me your ways, show me your ways, Jesus, show me
is yours is mine No I'm laying down my life again And I will testify A garden in a desert, living water from a rock. God, your love, it can't be stopped. All your ways are good. Like a city in the darkness, or a light upon a hill. Spirit, guide me to your will. All your ways are good. Asking in the Father's name, feel your heart to me. I want to bear the fruit that stays. Come abide in me.
before we uh, we go on service today, I uh, just wanted to share some news that yesterday, a dear congregate of ours who has been coming to Cornerstone for many years, Janet Bioki, suffered a heart attack yesterday and uh, was rushed to the emergency room. Uh, I don't have any details as far as uh, her status. I'm, I'm praying and hoping everything's okay. I just found out. Uh, from Douglas today, um, but there was a great word of the Lord this morning, first service, and I want to share that with you guys and be obedient to that still second service. And uh, the word was to give our all to God and that there's nothing too big. There's nothing, again, too small, but it's the act of giving it to him. It's the step of faith. It's stepping forward. So what I want to do right now is if you came in here today and there's a circumstance you're going through, if it's a body ailment, if it's a a family situation, if it's a financial situation, or just maybe you're you're struggling and you just need right now prayer, what what I want to do is just if you could raise your hand and give us as a church body an opportunity to pray over you. And we're gonna also pray over Janet in this moment. But if that is you and you, you need prayer this morning, you came in and you, can you give us the opportunity to pray over you? Uh, just right now, if that is you, don't miss out on this opportunity right now to, to give what you need to give to the Lord this morning. All right, let us, let us band together. So if that's you, please raise your hand. And if you see a hand up right now, just look around. If you see a hand up, can you please meet those people where they're at? Can we just pray as a group right now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just come together right now. And Lord, we're just saying, Lord, I'm giving whatever circumstance, whatever whatever I'm going through, we're giving it to you, Lord. Lord, maybe we're at the end of a rope, we're at the end of ideas, or maybe, Lord, we're scared, or maybe there's a health ailment, Jesus. We're just praying right now, a healing for anybody in this room right now or watching online, Jesus, that are raising their hand. And we are praying, Lord, that you meet them where they're at and that they are healed in the name of Jesus. Lord, if there's somebody in this room right now who is going through a situation, Lord, that feels too big and that they're just a small person, Lord, we serve a big God. We serve a God, Lord, where circumstances that may seem too small are not too small, or circumstances that seem too big are not too big. But Lord, we're gonna take a step of faith this morning and we're gonna say, Lord, I give it to you. I give all my circumstances to you, Jesus. We lay them at the cross, Lord, where you died on the, for our sins and you died for these circumstances, Lord. And we're gonna step of faith right now and say, Lord, we give it all to you. And Jesus, right now, we're gonna pray over Janet Bioki. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would meet her where she's at, Lord. Lord, that you would heal her body. Lord, that you would bring the, the, the spirit of peace in her life, that you bring the spirit of peace in that family, Lord. You know the circumstances, Lord, that is happening in that family. You know what they've walked through in the past few months. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that there be a breakthrough in that family, that there be a healing in that family. Yes, right now, just keep praying. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. And Lord God, we just come together again and we just say, Lord, thank you. Lord, we can't do things by our own strength. Lord, we can't do things by our own strength. But what we can do is to step in faith and to give it to you and let you handle it, Lord. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Can we give praise to God right now? Thank you, Jesus. Let's also show our appreciation to this worship team. Thank you guys so much for leading us in worship this morning. You guys may be seated, and we're going to get ready for tithe and offering. Man, the Lord is good. Amen. (laughs) I just feel like each week it's getting better and better. (laughs) The presence is here. A um, few things uh, as the ushers are getting ready. My name is Pastor Matthew. Pastor Scott is not here with us today. The whole Hogue family uh, has decided to take a plane trip 
well-deserved, to Idaho, where Jesse and Lanta, um, their son-in-law and daughter, had planted a new church. Uh, and we're, we're with them this morning. We're praying for them this morning. And I asked, I said, hey, you know, I'm just curious, like, how many people are you expecting this Sunday morning? Because it's not easy, you know, coming from one location to another location and trying to, you know, generate a following of people for your congregation. And they told me that they were expecting 300 people for their first Sunday. Day. And so I thought that was super exciting. You know, our prayers are with them. So I just wanted to give you guys that update. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this tithe and this offering, Lord. And we just pray that you would bless this house, Lord. Bless our own houses. Increase in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements before uh, Pastor Jonathan comes up and delivers the word. Um, we have a cup of hope on the calendar, which I'm super excited about. Not that I go to them because they're for the women, but I always love hearing Becca come back and tell me about how it went. If you're not familiar with Cup of Hope, it is a women's event where you you go and you just receive an amazing testimony of and how God has changed somebody's life. And uh, our very own, she's just walked in, uh, Emily Parker's our speaker. Uh, and if you know anything about Emily Parker, she's amazing. There is a joy of the Lord on her life. Uh, anybody, I think, who talks to Emily knows that. Um, so she's going to come share a, a great story and a testimony of how God has moved in her life. By the way, thank you, Emily, for being so responsive to the Lord in that. I know you're like, hi. <laughs> So come September 30th is um, when that is happening. It's at 10 a.m. here at the property. Uh, ladies, sign up on cornerstoneantica.com. Uh, my last announcement is uh, we are doing a musical here at the church. Uh, if, you, if you don't know, we, we love theater. We love creative arts here at Cornerstone. We've done lots of things at our last property. That's not ceasing. We're not stopping that. Um, so we're doing a cool Christmas play called The Best Christmas Pageant I think that's it. The best Christmas pageant. But if you see if you see the graphic, it actually says worst, and they crossed it out and put best. So I have high hopes that this could be really great and funny. I'm, I love comedy. Um, why I'm telling you about it so early is they've actually opened up auditions to adults, which doesn't happen very often. And let me tell you, it's really enriching to like be involved in stuff like that. I was involved, and a couple of us uh, uh, in this room were also involved in previous plays. It's so much fun. It's so much fun to, like, act and fi figure out a passion that maybe you've never thought was there. Uh, October 2nd and 3rd are the audition dates. You can find more of that information as well on our website. All right, I'm going to invite Pastor Jonathan up to the stage. Can we give him a warm welcome as he continues on with the series of Joyride? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just wanted to uh, thank you, Pastor uh, Scott, for inviting me to come up and speak. I wanted to say something. I said it to the last service. I want to say it to you. Um, I was talking to my wife today, and uh, we were just, we just are so impressed with this church and, and the people, you, the people of this church. You guys are so loving, so kind, and just uh, just welcoming, and uh, that's, that's huge. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we've been uh, in this series on joy and uh, how many of you have ever faced a crisis in your life? Yeah, I think all of us have, right? The car breaks down, the child gets seriously sick, your job is in jeopardy, you have a marital fight, maybe you miss your flight at the airport. What's the natural reaction that we all have when faced with these kinds of situations? The answer is worry and anxiety, right? We don't have to try to feel those things, right? That just automatically, that's what we have, right? We have worry and anxiety when we're faced with these kind of situations. We stress out and we just get filled with anxiety. I want to tell you a story from my life of a time when I wigged out. Um, so about 16 years ago, my wife and I were pastoring in a little town called Quincy. And we were new pastors and honestly somewhat new parents. Uh, our, our middle son was only um, four years old at the time. His name's Caleb. He's here today. And um, one day or one evening, my wife and I were sitting in the living room watching TV. And 
my son Caleb, who's four years old, and his older brother, who's about three years older than him, so he's about seven, they're wrestling around, running around the house, fighting, whatever, you know, just playing. And we, we lose sight of them because they go into our bedroom, and all of a sudden we hear this crash. And my son, my middle son Caleb, again, four years old, comes out, and I can tell something's wrong. He's holding his arm, and something is wrong. And so I rush to him, I say, well, are you okay? And I grab his arm, and it's like jello. He had, I knew immediately he had broken his arm. And, and, and here's the thing. I have, at this point in my life, I've never broken a bone in my, in my body. Maybe a toe or something like that, but nothing, no, no arms or anything. I've never experienced that pain or experienced that situation. My anxiety went through the roof, right? Because he's four years old, his arm's like jello, and I'm just like, what, what do we do? I've never experienced this. So my wife's freaking out, I'm freaking out. We decide, okay, we rush him to the hospital, the whole time, we're just like stressed out of our minds. And we just, we rush him to the hospital. We get to the hospital and we kind of hand him off to the doctors. And you know the doctors, they're, they're trained to do this, but they're calm, right? They're calm. They're, they're, gent they're just like, hey, you know, it's like, it's like no big deal. It's all going to be fine. We'll get him. We'll get a cast. He's done, da, da, da. So we get there. We hand him off. And I start to decompress. I'm like, okay, we're at the hospital. He's in good hands. He's going to be fine. I mean, I, I grew up watching, you know, kids at school. They break their arm. They get a cast. I mean, you know, it, it's a normal thing of life. You know, it happens. Okay. So I'm trying to just calm myself down. So they take Caleb in to get an x-ray. And they're, they're, uh, they close the door. They go take the x-ray. Next thing I know, they walk out. And immediately I know something's wrong. Because the atmosphere has changed. Where the doctors were encouraging and just calm, I can tell they're, they're trying to be calm, but their anxiety is up here. And I knew something's wrong. And they, they told us, they said, we, we can't touch him. We can't do anything for him because his break is so bad that it's right next to the artery. It's jagged. And if it touches that, that break, the artery touches that break, it could damage the artery and he could bleed out. And so they, this is a small town hospital, right? So they said, we don't have the capability to deal with this. So we're going to send him to Truckee, which is like an hour and a half away, where they have specialists. And I don't know if you know this, but in a small town, you know, you gotta, if they drove there, it would take like an hour and a half. It was all a big mess. It was bumpy roads and everything. So they said, you know, it'd be better if we could use a, a, the, the helicopter. Well, we happen to have helicopter insurance. Thank God. Somebody in our small town told us to get it and we got it. And so, but I, my card was at home. So I had to run home to get it. Now I, this whole time I've been trying to be strong for my wife and everybody and just kind of like, Hey, it's all right. We're, you know, it's good. Everything's going to be good. The minute I hit the car, I just started melt. I just had a meltdown. I just started crying. I just started begging God, God help him. Please don't let anything, you know, anything go wrong with him. And I just started weeping. And I just literally melted, melt, had a meltdown. And God, all of a sudden, God spoke to me. He says, stop. You're acting like somebody who doesn't have God in his life. And I realized it was true. I was, I was so freaked out. I was, had so much anxiety. And yet, here we have a God who can take care of the situation. And who is always taking care of us. I wigged out. I freaked out. You know, the truth is, when we go through a crisis, just so you know, my, my son's fine, right? Everything's good. <laughs> Don't want to leave you hanging there. <laughs> um, but uh, when we go through a crisis, we break out in the case of the worries, right? It's almost like it's a disease. You know, like we're, have this, we have this allergic reaction to crisis, and when we go through a crisis, we break out in that allergic reaction. We break out in the case of the worries. And, and we just have that anxiety. But have, have you ever met someone who faced a crisis and they had peace? They, they weren't worried or stressed. They weren't blowing in a paper bag or breathing in a paper bag. They were at 
peace in the midst of their, their situation crumbling around them. And you're looking at them going, man, you should be freaking out. And instead, they were calm. They had peace. It's like they had taken an antidote to that worry and that anxiety. I'm going to tell you another story. The story of my dad. I think I shared this story a while back, but I'm going to share it again. So my, my father uh, and my older brother went to the mall where we lived. We lived uh, in the Bay Area, close to Concord. There's a Concord Mall. I think it's called Sun Valley Mall. <clears throat> um, anyway, so they were there. It was Christmas time. They were shopping. Um, and, uh, and as they're walking through the mall, a plane crashes into the top of the mall. People are panicking. People are just freaking out. There's fire. There's all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, the ceiling crumbling here and there. And um, there's just such panic. Now, here's the thing. Here's the interesting thing. They said that most of the injuries were not because of the plane crash. It was because of the people who were freaking out and panicking and running out of the building and getting, like, run over by cars because they were just freaked out. But that's the situation that, that my, my dad and my brother were in. They're watching everybody panic and rush out of the building. And my dad reaches back, calmly reaches back, grabs my son's arm, says, son, follow me. We're going to the exit. And he just calmly walks to the exit. Now my brother's freaking out and he's like going, dad, we got to get out of here. Woo, what's going on? And, and he just says, dad, how can you be so calm? He said, because I have God. And I know where I'm going if I die. And he walked out of that building with peace and calm in that crisis situation. You know, I think, I know that all of us want to be able to face a crisis situation with that level of peace and calm in our life. I don't think I know anybody who says, no, 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 I want to worry. I want to freak out, right? I want to melt down like you did. You know, that's no, we want to have that peace and that calm. So how do we do that? How do we get that? How do we come up with that antidote to worry and anxiety? Well, Paul gives it to us in Philippians 4, 4 through 8. And it all boils down to this. I'm going to give you the, give you the answer. It boils down to this. Choose joy. Choose joy. Joy. Now we're going to go into more detail, but choose joy is the antidote to worry and fear. We've been studying the book of Philippians for several weeks, so most of us know the background of this book. But let me remind you of a few things. This was a letter written by Paul to the church in Philippi. Philippi is a city. And while Paul wrote this letter, he was a prisoner in Rome, chained to a Roman guard for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Not only that, but while he's there, a prisoner, he's been waiting for his trial for about two years. Okay, they didn't have speedy trials like we do in America, right? It took two years and he still hadn't been seen, right? They still didn't get to him. <clears throat> But not only that, it gets worse. On the way to Rome to become a prisoner, right? Paul is shipwrecked. How many of you have ever experienced a shipwreck, right? Nobody, right? Oh, hey, somebody. <laughs> you have to tell me about that. Uh, but he was shipwrecked and bitten by a poisonous snake. Now, this is not, obviously, this is not a, uh, a joyous situation, Right? He's not experiencing good things, right? But here, but listen to what he says to us. As I, as I pointed out earlier, the natural response to a situation like this that Paul's in is to worry and be filled with anxiety. Maybe even start complaining. But listen to what Paul teaches his listeners to do when faced with adversity and trials of life. This is what he says in Philippians Chapter 4, verse, verse 4 through 8, it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. What that means <clears throat> is to celebrate who God is and what he has done. 
God is so amazing. He is so amazing. And there are so many things that we can praise him for. Paul is telling us we need to celebrate God in all of his goodness. Rejoice in the Lord. But then Paul takes it a step further. And he says, always. Always. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. That means that in in good times and bad times, we should be rejoicing in the goodness of God. Now you may be thinking, yeah, right. Who does that? Right? We all worry and fear and we're just, we freak out. That's just normal. That's what people do. But remember this, that Paul didn't just teach us, teach us this, he lived it. Let me give you an example. When Paul was on his first, or I'm sorry, when he was on his second missionary journey, he and a friend named Silas visited the very city that he's writing to in Philippi. Right? He visited that city. And while there, Paul cast a demon out of a little girl. Now, this little girl was the servant of some men who used her to make money by having her tell people's fortunes, right? Now, this angered the men because now they're out of money, right? They've lost their revenue stream. So what they do, these men, is they drag Paul and Silas to the authorities and they lie and accuse Paul and Silas of teaching illegal customs to the people and stirring the people up, right? Now let's read what happens. <clears throat> Acts 16, 22 through 25 says this. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden, wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure They didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the the stocks. Now I want to pause here before I finish this verse because I want you to understand something. They were beaten with wooden rods. And not just a not just a minor, like, you know, slapping them around. I mean, it says they were severely beaten with these wooden rods. Then they were taken to the to the innermost dungeon. They don't get a view for, to the outside. They don't get a window. They're in the, in the smelly, stinky dungeon. It's not like prison we have here today. It's like horrible. You don't want to be there, right? And they're clamped in these stocks. That's what they've experienced. But listen to their response. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Most of us would be licking our wounds and feeling sorry for ourselves while we worry about what comes next. Right? Am I going to be beaten again? Am I going to be able to get, be set free at any time? Or, or maybe they're going to execute us. I don't know. The what ifs are going to be flying, right? But Paul and Silas, they do something different. They begin to rejoice and sing praise songs to God. They chose to have joy in the midst of their crisis. Why? What happens when we rejoice instead of complaining and worrying? Why is Paul telling us to do this? What happens is when we rejoice instead of allowing ourselves to be filled with worry and anxiety and complaining is it enables us to focus less on our problems and more on God. When we focus on our problems, they just seem to get bigger and scarier, don't they? The more we think about our problems, the more we start thinking about those what-ifs. We imagine all kinds of horrible situations that might happen to us, and it creates that anxiety in us. But when you begin to worship God in the midst of your crisis, your problems start to shrink and you begin to see the greatness of God. You begin to realize that God is bigger than any problem you face and he's on your side. He cares about you and he is always more than enough. So the first part of the antidote to worry 
is to rejoice in the Lord always. Now, I want to say, I want to talk about verse five real quick. It just, this is just, I kind of lump this together with the first part because basically what Paul's telling us here, he says this, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is here. The, the Lord is near. This means don't be cranky and have, when you're going through a crisis, don't be cranky and have a bad attitude because instead let that joy, let that joy of the Lord that you're fostering inside of you come out of you. Let other people see that joy of the Lord. Be kind, be gentle, right? That's kind of what Paul's saying. <clears throat> now let's look at the next part in verse six. Paul says this, don't, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Paul is saying here, he's saying that when you face challenging times, don't be filled with anxiety. Instead, ask God for what you need. Focus your anxious energy on prayer instead of worry. Worry is all about the what-ifs and the worst-case scenarios. Worry makes us feel hopeless and helpless. But here's the truth. God can do anything. He is big enough and strong enough to handle any and every situation. We just have to ask Him. So we don't ever need to feel hopeless or helpless. We just need to pray. So when faced with a crisis... Instead of rehearsing the what ifs, we need to get on our knees and ask God to intervene. Now, Paul doesn't just tell us to pray. He says something important. He says, we should pray with thanksgiving. This is very important because it sets the tone of our prayers. As, I've already, as we've already established, when we face a crisis situation, our natural reaction is to worry and to be filled with anxiety, right? Well, if we let it, that worry and anxiety can seep into our prayers. We may be praying, but we're praying prayers of fear and worry. We're not praying uh, prayers of faith and expectation. But the Bible doesn't teach us to pray worried and fearful prayers. It teaches, teaches us pray with that faith and that expectation, that means you believe that God has already granted your request and the answer to your prayer is on the way. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. Listen to this. This is Jesus speaking. This is what he says in Mark eleven twenty-three 23 through 24. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. There is power in prayer. Power in prayer. But we must pray with expectation and faith, not fear and worry. So when Paul tells us to pray with thanksgiving, he's telling us to focus on the things that God has already done for us. Thank him for the miracles he's already provided that relate to what you need him to do now. If you're, if you're sick and you need healing, then thank God for the times when he has already healed you or someone close to you. If it's a financial crisis that you're going through, thank God for the times when he's already provided. This is going to bolster your faith. But don't forget to thank God for the answer that you're praying for right now. Because if you indeed if expect God to answer your prayer, then you should thank him in advance, right? You should be like, God, thank you. I know you're gonna do this. I just believe that you're gonna answer my prayer. You're gonna provide that money that I need for rent this month. You're gonna do this because I know you. And I know what you've promised in your word, and I, and I just believe that. And Lord, thank you. I know I haven't received that money yet, but I know it's on the way. God, thank you for that. That's, that's how Paul wants us. That's what Paul's teaching us to do when he says pray 
with thanksgiving. So when we're faced with a crisis and we don't want and we don't want to be plagued with worry, then we, need to, then we have two things that we need to do. We need to rejoice in the Lord at all times, and we need to pray with an attitude of thanksgiving. When we do those two things, this is what Paul says will happen in verse 7. I love this. Look at this. It says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's break down this verse so we understand it. The first part says the peace of God. It's important for us to understand where this peace comes from. It comes from God. It's supernatural peace. Paul Paul isn't just telling you to calm down. Stop worrying, right? Have you ever had somebody, have you ever been like freaking out and somebody tells you to calm down? You just like get angry. You're like, what? Stop telling me. You're you're frustrated with that, right? Because how are you supposed to just... Calm down, right? It doesn't work that way. That's not what Paul's doing. He's not saying, hey, calm down. He's saying, listen. He's saying, if you do the two things that I told you to do above, then God will take away your anxiety and give you a supernatural peace. God will do it. This peace comes from God, not from you, from God. And then Paul says this, this peace, he's talking about this peace, this supernatural peace. He says, which transcends all understanding. According to Paul, this peace is so incredible, it defies understanding. What does he mean by that? Paul is saying that when you are faced with a crisis and your world feels like it's collapsing, the normal response is to be filled with anxiety, fear, and worry. But God's supernatural peace takes all that away. You'll be facing those terrifying situations and yet you're going to be calm. You're going to have peace in the midst of the storm. It's not going to make sense because you know you should be filled with anxiety. But instead you have peace. That's what he means by it. It transcends understanding. Then Paul continues and says this about the supernatural peace that God gives us. He says, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This phrase in the original language has military overtones to it. It means that the peace of God will guard your heart and mind at sword point. It will guard your mind and heart from anxiety and worry. It will not allow anxiety and worry to overcome you. You will have a supernatural peace. It's guarding you. But here's the thing. You and I, this supernatural peace is guarding us from fear, from worry, from anxiety. And it won't let those things come and overwhelm us. But... You and I can invite those things back into our life. We can invite anxiety, worry, fear back into our life. And here's the thing about God. God is a gentleman. God gives us free choice, right? So he never forces us to do things or to accept things. And so when we do, when we're going to talk about this in a second, but based on what we allow uh, uh, what we think about and what we allow to influence our thoughts can cause us to invite that fear, that anxiety, and that worry back in. And when we do that, basically what we're saying is, God, I don't want that peace. I want to worry. I want to fear. I want to have that anxiety. Now, I know you're probably thinking, yeah, right. Who would ever say that, right? But that's exactly what we do when we, when we don't guard our own thoughts. And again, we're going to talk about this, just what I mean by that. But we have the power, the ability to reject God's peace and reintroduce those those, uh, feelings of anxiety, worry, and fear. And so Paul says, that's why Paul finishes this section of his letter by telling us what to think about in order to keep that peace of mind and heart. He says this, finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What Paul is telling us here is that we need to guard our thoughts so we don't reintroduce that worry, anxiety, and fear back into our lives. In this verse, Paul is teaching us that we can do that by what we allow to influence our thoughts. For example, something my family we do, or I should say we don't do, um, is we don't watch scary movies, like really scary, uh, suspenseful movies, right? Why? Now, let me, let me qualify this by saying this. Let me say this. I'm not telling you what to watch, okay? You guys got to make your own decision with the Holy Spirit, okay? What, what I don't do, may, you may go, ah, I can totally handle it, no problem. Okay, whatever. That's between you and the Lord, okay? I'm not telling you what to watch. But what we do, is we don't watch horror movies or movies that just are super suspenseful where it keeps you, you know, you're freaking out, right? Why don't we do that? Because have you ever watched those movies and afterwards, what are you doing? You're searching under the bed, you're looking in the closet, right? Every noise, you're freaking out going, oh my gosh, it's the axe murderer, I know he's here, I knew it, right? That's, that's what we're thinking. <clears throat> We've reintroduced anxiety, fear, and worry back into our lives because we've allowed ourselves, we've, we've allowed something to influence our thoughts and we're thinking, we're focusing our thoughts on something that is none of the things we just talked about or, or Paul just talked about. It's not noble, it's not good, it's not praiseworthy, right? Some ax murderer coming at all these people, chopping them up bit bits. That's not any of those things, right? <clears throat> we've reintroduced that fear and that anxiety into our life. So we have to be careful what we allow to influence our thoughts. Let me give you another example of something to avoid, especially when you're in a crisis situation. Negative people. The, I'm talking about the Eeyores of life, right? If you ever, ever watched a Winnie the Pooh cartoon, you know the little blue donkey named Eeyore? He's always negative, right? Right? He finds something to be negative about in every situation. We have to guard ourselves against those kind of people. The people who all they can do is see the negative and point it out to you. If you surround yourself with those kind of people, especially when you're in a crisis, it will reintroduce that fear and anxiety back into your life. Because your, because your thoughts are going to be focused on the things that they're focusing on, right? The world's coming to an end. We're all going to die. Oh, this is horrible. The, the political climate, all this and that. The economy. I mean, they're just going on and on. And of course, you're just going, oh my gosh, you're right. You know? The situation is horrible. And it's really not. It may be horrible, but you serve a God that's bigger. Am I right? And that's what you need to focus on. We need to guard ourselves against those kind of people. But here's the thing. Paul doesn't just tell us to avoid negative influences when he's, when he, in this verse. He tells us to fill our minds with good thoughts. Now, I said earlier that God's peace will guard your heart at sword point. But we have to guard our own thoughts at sword point. The Bible calls us the sword of the Lord, Right? We need to immerse ourselves in God's word. Immerse yourself in God's word. Now, listen, maybe you're going, yeah, 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 it's the same old story. We've got to read the Bible. We know, we know. But here's the thing. So many people don't do it. And can I just encourage you? Take 15 minutes a day. Pick a passage. Read it. And then just meditate on it. Now, I'm not talking about you know, Eastern meditation. I'm talking about just, just think about it. Ask yourself some questions. What does this mean? What does it mean to me? How can I apply this to my life? Just think on it. Can I just tell you, if you did that, it would do wonders for your mental health. 
Because you're immersing yourself in the truth of God. When you're careful about guarding your thoughts and filling them with good and wholesome, godly things, it will allow you to continue to have the peace of God in every circumstance. So Paul gives us the antidote to worry and anxiety, and it all centers around choosing joy. We rejoice in the Lord always. We pray with thanksgiving. And then we have this supernatural peace that defies all of our circumstances. And if we guard our thoughts, that peace will always be there when we need it. Can I ask you something real quick? I don't know if you're here today. Would you you all stand to your feet with me just for a moment? We're gonna close. We're gonna close in a worship song. But before we do, if you're here and you would say, Pastor, I've got an issue. I'm facing something right now. It's overwhelming. Maybe it's a crisis. Maybe you wouldn't qualify it as a crisis, but you're just, your reaction is worry, fear, anxiety. And you're like, Pastor, I don't want that. I want that peace of God. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Just slip up your hand and say, that's me. I need that peace of God right now. Hands all over. Here's what I want. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. What I want you to do is, while we're singing this song, is I want you to take the time to do what this verse, this passage that Paul uh, has written, and start to, to apply it right now. Begin to rejoice in the Lord. Maybe you're singing the song that we're going to sing, or maybe you sing your own song. Or maybe you just talk to God and say, God, you are amazing. You are so worthy of all praise and worship. God, you are amazing. Just begin to recite all the things that God has already done in your life and through you. Then pray. Pray, but don't pray a prayer of fear and worry. Pray a prayer of faith and expectation saying, God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you in advance for what you're about to do. And God, thank you for that time when you already did it. Lord, I'm, maybe I'm facing a financial crisis and I say, God, thank you for that time when you delivered that check to my door. They didn't even know about my financial situation, but they came to the door and they presented a check and it was for everything that I needed. God, you did that. And I know you'll do it again. Just begin to thank you as you pray. And I promise you, because the word of God says it, you will have peace, a supernatural peace. Let's just pray. Father, I just pray, Lord, for each and every person in this room, Lord, who's facing a situation where they're worried, they're afraid, they have anxiety. Father, I just pray as they begin to rejoice in you, as they begin to trust you, as they begin to to pray with that attitude of thanksgiving and faith, Lord, I pray that your, your peace, that supernatural peace, would just begin to flood their hearts and their lives as they trust in you. Because Lord, you are more than enough to take care of their situation. And I just pray, oh God, that you would help them to realize that. And Lord, give them that peace. Father, I pray that you would intervene in their circumstances. But right now, before you do that, I pray you would give them peace in the midst of the storm. And Lord, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Get in the Father's name Reveal your heart to me I want to bear the fruit that stays So come abide in me Sing it out Show me
Amen. Amen. Well, it was a joy to worship with you guys this morning. Would you give a round of applause for uh, Pastor Jonathan? Thank you for joining us today. It's always a treat to have you. Uh, let me just pray for us before we go out to our weeks. Father, uh, we sing, show me your ways. Lord, I pray those words over my brothers and sisters here today and, and over myself, Father, would your ways become just so clear and evident to us in our lives. Um, Father, make your face known in our lowest of valleys and our highest of mountains. Because Father, we, uh, we are nothing without you and we need you. So Father, guide us, bless us continually with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Be with us now as we go into our work weeks. We thank you for your many blessings and your many mercies and graces that you lavish over us time and time again. We love you, Lord. We say these things in your wonderful, beautiful name. God's family said, amen, amen. Enjoy. Have a wonderful week.